We'd be exhausted in short order if we had to lead the skittish, hyper-alert life of songbirds. They twitch their heads to check the skies for predators dozens of times every minute. And the smaller the bird, the more fidgety he is. So that the larger species, like cardinals and robins, seem almost lethargic in comparison. I have three short videos for you about those fidgety birds. The flitty flighty flibberty gibbets agile enough to catch the kind of insects that ricochet off thin air. A blue-gray gnatcatcher is four inches long from tip to tip. And that's a little more than half the length of an ink pen. And almost half of that four inches is just tail feathers. So he weighs only a whisper, a fifth of an ounce. His muted gray body, scarcely bigger than a ping pong ball, can be nigh on impossible to spot high in a tree's foliage. Worse than a Where's Waldo puzzle, but only if he sits still, which, bless his heart, he really can't do for very long at a time. He's a hyperactive four-year-old, zipping from twig to branch to twig like a, well, like a very large gnat or a dragonfly. He eats fast-moving insects and he has to be able to keep up. He also eats slow-moving bugs, like spiders and roly-polies, but catching them is a matter of getting them to move so he'll see them. His exclamation point of a tail flicks around to stir them up. The net catcher doesn't so much whistle while he works as buzz. Like a high-pitched insect, he says, See, see. You couldn't call it a song, really, but the funny part is that he actually can sing. He mimics other birds, mixing their songs in with his own buzz, so often that some call him Little Mockingbird. A bird he physically resembles, by the way. Listen to a mimic. Now, I'm not sure what bird that was that he was imitating there, but I do know that this particular gnat catcher hears a prothonotary warbler frequently. Here the gnat catcher is at his nest, hearing the prothonotary, then mimicking him. You might have noticed that in some shots the blue-gray gnat catcher looked gray, and in others he looked blue. Now, lighting can make a big difference, but you should also know that the male has more blue tint to his plumage than the female does. She sits on the nest and has to be dull-colored to avoid the notice of predators. This pair has built itself a flexible little residence of lichen and spider webs. Too small to be called cozy, the nest doesn't even hold the entire bird. The female's head and tail always stick out, as if she'd been stuffed in by the middle. But she seems satisfied and is even a persnickety housekeeper. The odds of them raising a successful brood are good because the numbers of blue-gray gnatcatchers are increasing. Warblers. Now that genus contains dozens of hyperactive species that'll cross your eyes.
warblers in treetops will drive you crazy. Flitty flighty pixies that dodge around behind the foliage, making it flick and tremble as they chase insects and avoid our binoculars. Their size is part of the problem. This female house sparrow perching near a red start underlines how diminutive the warblers are. Next to these leprechauns, house sparrows start to look like sumo wrestlers. So considering the peekaboo habits of these warblers, I appreciate the way the two artificial stream beds in our yard bring them out into the open. In the fall, we see them alight in a bare cedar branch we put there as a staging site. Once they've looked the area over for threats, we often venture in for a dip. Now, of course, without the nearby tract of woods we have to lure them in, we'd see far fewer warblers in the yard, no matter how inviting our stream beds are. But the woods draw them, and in September and October, these jewels sparkle in the water. Oh, sure, there's still bouncy, flitty, flighty sprites who change their minds and their direction while we're still forming an intention. But when you see them swivel on the point of a pin like this, pause midair to consider their options and then spurt away, you understand how it's possible for them to catch gnats, mosquitoes, and all manner of flitty flighty insects. And I confess that I have a favorite warbler, the American Red Start. They're common and we see them at the stream beds more than any other warbler. The male's orange highlights fling sunshine at you. And the females are also striking with their flashes of yellow, punctuating soft grays and olive green. Well, this might be a female, or in autumn, it might also be a juvenile. Herders often refer to this version of the red start as a yellow start. The start part of their name comes from an old English word that means tail. And these warblers use that start or tail of theirs to startle bugs. The books tell me that red starts are unusually active, even for warblers, that they spike their tails out to startle insects into action and then chase them down. And that's the long version of how they behave. The short version is that they're quick as a hiccup. The kinglets, ruby-crowned and golden-crowned, are about the same size as the blue-gray gnatcatcher. And they are at least as wound up as the gnatcatcher. Songbirds range from staid morning doves to feisty kinglets. The morning doves are easier to spot. Even when you're looking at a kinglet 15 feet away, he'll likely be hard to see because well, he could use any one of those leaves for a bathrobe. He's that tiny. And the foliage is color-coordinated with his plumage. Plus, of course, he doesn't stay put. Just when you think you've drawn a bead on him, poof, he's a couple feet away. No, four feet, no, six feet. Zigzagging, always zigzagging. Maybe you spot him, but more often you just know where he is by the trembling foliage or by his fussing. And speaking of the chittering bickering he's prone to, if he gets his dander up, he'll spit expletives. And maybe come out in the open for a few seconds to do it. That's usually your best chance to see his ruby crown, which pops up mainly when he's excited. I didn't get that lucky this time, but wait for it. If you have reason to suspect there's a kinglet in there, you can peg it as the ruby crown if you get lucky enough to see the ruby, or if you see no brilliant crown at all. Because the golden crowned kinglet wears his black bordered gleaming coronet all the time. So considering their furtive habits, I was thrilled to see a golden crowned kinglet jumping around in sparse foliage, looking to snag the same sort of prey the blue-gray gnatcatcher pursues. That's what kinglets do when they're not scolding the universe. 
I'll bet you know a few gnats that aren't that frisky. An even better kinglet sighting came when the ruby crown showed up for a bath at the man-made stream beneath our window. For once, naked in all his twitching glory, including his somebody goose me spasms every few seconds. Now, bathing songbirds all look as if electric shocks are pulsing through them, but the kinglet actually levitates. And now watch this loop-de-loop -loop coming up. And sometimes he gets double goosed. He preened for a while, staying in one spot for several seconds before finishing his preening on the move. And before disappearing into the underbrush, he gave me a look at his crown. Is it just me, or do his close-set eyes make this midget look fierce? Watch him again in slow-mo and see what you think. There's no way to know whether he feels as fierce as he looks, but this much is certain. His strings are stretched taut. Any tighter and he would just go boing, 